welcome to In Conversation. I'm Adam Doyle. So years ago, um, when I was in the midst of working regularly illustrating cards for the Android Netrunner series, um, I noticed there was another artist there, or another freelance artist involved, whose work really stood out to me. So um, I just saw her name and found her on Facebook and sent her a message just saying, hey, your work is, is really lovely. Um, keep it up. So cut to five years later, just recently, she just messaged me back and apologized. Um, and we just, we chatted and uh, I said, if you're up for it, um, would you, you know, be down for a conversation over Zoom? Because I think that, I mean, there's stuff that I'm curious about as a fellow illustrator. And I think that there's, there's stuff there from the field, from the craft that other illustrators in particular, uh, maybe, you know, aspiring illustrators might be interested in learning about. So her name is Lig Schmilschkan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She's uh, Latvian. She lives in uh, Riga, Latvia. And um, her work is just really luminous and enchanting. Uh, post I'll post the uh, links to her work below so you can look at it. I'm also including some images in this video. So she's a digital artist and she really loves creating surreal creatures. We'll talk about that and we'll talk about how the change of seasons affects her work schedule. Uh, we'll talk about uh, her fear of pants <laughs> and her very curious sounding cat. So um, she didn't have a camera so that's why this will be an audio version um, but fortunately her microphone is much better than mine so you'll be able to hear pretty clearly um, with that let's get started oh you you actually said it just right <laughs> <laughs> mission accomplished it's a league smells called so yeah there, there we go okay just to start you know we'll start at the beginning and just i uh, just like to ask you i'm just curious about um, growing up in Latvia and how art and illustration was something that became a part of your life? Well, basically at the ripe old age of about three, <clears throat> my mom decided to give me some paints and a piece of paper and uh, see what happens. So here we are now. <laughs> so you're what, four or five? <laughs> <laughs> um, just about yeah. <laughs> yeah so all right so you just started when you were a little kid yeah like me too um and uh and so i take it based on that that your parents have been supportive or your mom at least i mean they couldn't do anything to stop it at that point so <laughs> they just kind of um went along with it <laughs> no, i don't know i just fell in love with drawing i suppose yeah. i mean it's fun well, it, the real crux of the question is, um, it's something that we all have to face when we make this profession, is this thing that we love to do, is it is it a thing that we do just for ourselves and it's personal, it's, on, it's, on the, it's a hobby, it's on the side, and we do something else for a job, for a career, or, you know, making it, just going full, all in and making this thing, this art thing, uh, the profession. So I think that's probably more where there's any kind of friction when it comes to either personal, the sort of personal choice or with family and parents and other people is, you know, kind of how realistic it is to, to do this. So I guess when I'm asking about if your parents have been supportive, um, I guess that's more about it being a, a profession and, and when you made that choice. Uh, well, I never actually plan to go into art as a profession mm -hmm. like my education is, compl is in completely different fields i um went to university for economics and business yeah. and then after that well I, I didn't quite end up liking that course so much i mean i took it and all that but they had such a heavy emphasis on accounting and that was definitely not something i was going to do so I, I think you can maybe hear my cat <laughs> Yeah, And then afterwards, I was like, well, I'm going to do something else. So I also went and studied um, politics. There are definitely mm -hmm. cat noises now. But just 
I mean, I was drawing the whole time, like little commissions on the side, and sure? then at one one day that email from FFG show, uh, showed up and was like, "Hey, do you want to draw something for a um, cyberpunk game?" I was like, um, "Sure, <laughs> why not?" Cyberpunk didn't sound like my thing, but sure. And well, at that point, I was pretty much in it, more or less full time with uh, everything else and an entrepreneur and just everything all together. I feel like that's kind of the point where I just basically was doing it as a um, full time job, more or less. It just kind of um, happened. I'm pretty surprised to hear that you. I mean, that's impressive, you know, that you think for economics and then, well, you know, took your, your love of art um, to to such a level, you know, a professional level. Yeah, it's just, I know, sometimes things just kind of turn out in a way you don't expect. <laughs> Especially when it comes to which field you have education in and which field you practically end up working in. I think it's like that for a lot of people. What about yourself? How did you end up working professionally as an artist? Uh, um, yeah, for me, it's it's totally different. You know, I mean, I'll just say quickly that uh, you know, like you, I you know got into art and making pictures and books, especially when I was uh, a little kid, and stuck with it um, my whole life. But it was really in high school when the decision, the choice was was there, you know, it was presented of, to where do I go next to, when I go to college? Do I go to the regular school? Do I go to art school? And I had to think about it and I decided I wanted to, to do art. So, I mean, I went to art school and studied for four years and then went out in the world. And sometime later, it was like seven years later, I went back and went to grad school in, in art as well, in illustration. So, um, and I'd been doing professional work you know, even like some jobs like in high school and then in college and um, and everything. So the whole idea of like stumbling into it, you know, things just happen is is a totally different um, experience than the way it's been in my life because it's always been the number one thing I've always been concerned with and interested in and devoted to. But I understand that it's, it's different for everybody. We probably also have a slightly different like schooling situation because in Latvia there's one um, academy of arts, mm-hmm. which is like the one choice you would have if you want um, if you don't want to study somewhere abroad, which I wasn't like super keen on. Mm. So uh, basically went for a more conventional choice of education and thinking of a more so to say conventional choice of profession. It just just ended up sticking to the art you know <laughs> there were like commissions and drawing this and doing this a cover for this and a commission for that and it's just kind of like no I, I'm happy doing this as a work this is great this is my dream job I'm just I'm just gonna do this <laughs> yeah I mean so part of the part of the surprise for me in hearing that is that your work feels very personal and developed and you know, technically very solid. So f- to not have like learned a lot of that and gone through the, you know, the still lives and the model poses and all that stuff, it's impressive that you, that you are where you are. Um, I do miss having some kind of education, especially figure drawing. That's the one thing that I feel like, yeah, that, that, that would have been nice. <laughs> Sure. I mean, but like even having had it and even people who, who work from, you know, figure all the time, it's, it's like, you never, it's, it's, you know, figures is not something you can ever in a sense really master. I feel like people who have the most impressive portrait skills yeah. will be the first to say that they're still amateurs when it comes to capturing a person, you know, in paint. How did you go from, you know, going to um, a, a, a regular arts school to being able, like being sought out by Fantasy Flight Games? Like how, how, what were you doing all that time? Like what were you producing? Yeah, I'm actually, I never found out 
how they found me. So I'm not sure which thing I was doing that, you know, actually led to it. <laughs> there was a whole lot of just, you know, putting all of my stuff out there just everywhere, which is to say I would do all kinds of like, um, I did a few commissions for um, Bella Sara, which was on a fairly large game at the time then a whole lot of like private commissions some book covers some this and oh, that okay so and you were you were you were doing you were you had a lot of projects you had projects, yeah right? I, I was okay. constantly doing is something but nothing quite like attached to a larger project or a company at that point so yeah. i was extremely obscure mm -hmm. i think what may have helped was that at that time ballistic publishing was quite active because i would send stuff into their art books and have a bunch of things accepted I think that was like um, something that our directors may have looked at. Right. What What is it called? Ballistic? I haven't heard of it. Ballistic Publishing. They did um, Expose. Expose was probably the better known ser series. So this is, I mean, this might sound silly because I'm in the States and you're in Latvia, but I am curious if if your upbringing and like Latvian culture is something that's present in your work. Because I, I don't know, so I'm curious if that's if that's there. Hmm. I don't know. That's a difficult question to answer, considering that I largely draw whenever I can. I draw like slightly surreal, mostly creatures and mm -hmm. yeah. people as well. But I couldn't say if there is anything. Because, well, the thing is, I know what it's like to live here, but of course I have no idea what it's like to grow up somewhere else. So it is a very difficult thing to compare. <laughs> right. I guess what I'm saying is I don't know a lot about Latvian um, history or arts or culture. So that's that's why I guess I'm asking that, because I'm just curious if maybe there was an influence there that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I've been mostly looking at like, um, you know, basically Western influences when it comes to art and stuff, not so much local stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have especially a rich history in all kinds of landscape painting. There are a few more well, domestically known painters who specialize in that and do an amazing job, but it's not really the subject matter I've ever strongly pursued, so I don't think there's too much going on in influences. Well, also because I don't have like a formal art school education locally so I, I probably escaped a lot of that <laughs> sure yeah. and you 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 work uh you know you mentioned that when you were a kid working you know with um, paints and paper and stuff and mm -hmm. and you work digitally now uh is that like exclusive you you know you found your your medium working digitally it's a lot more convenient because I can just go slam the colors in there right away. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and that's the most fun part. Um, well, also, I'm allergic to quite a lot of stuff that goes into oil painting. So that kind of the more mm. serious medium there or anything like um, with these kinds of non-water non soluble paints is um, a bit of a major no-no for me. Oh, okay. So that's another thing that made me lean more into digital like I've done some stuff with acrylics, but mm -hmm. also another thing is that since I'm selling effectively always abroad, it means that if I'm painting traditionally, then it comes with a lot of hassle of um, taking good photos of the work or shipping it in some way and so on and so forth. So digital just uh, is a way more convenient for me. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Having, you know, doing both it, uh, digital is just it's so much easier it's so much mm -hmm. less stuff to have to deal with yeah. Yeah, especially with um because most of my work comes from the states so imagine what the shipping would be like <laughs> yeah yeah that's true um what programs do you, you corel what programs do you prefer to use yeah it's mostly Cor corel painter for the most part because um it's one of the um, first things that i tried that uh, i really like the interface of yeah Th that is that is the big reason <laughs> also sure. it has some really nice blending tools and that kind of stuff um the photoshop at that time 
didn't quite have that kind of blending when I was just kind of getting into digital art. Mm -hmm. So I settled on the painter and I uh, more or less stayed with it. I gotta try it. I, I, you know, every once in a while I'll try some program, you know, I met when we were talking about a clip studio and um, art rage I tried and I just never, I can never really get it to work for myself, but yeah. Um, yeah painter I mean, is a little janky sometimes. There seem mm -hmm. to be every now and then there's going to be a version that is maybe buggier than it should be mm -hmm. but i personally find it quite convenient to use just in the way like you can customize the layouts a fair bit and it's like fairly intuitive about uh, how the brushes work and where to find things and so on and so forth so it's like eh, i rather like it <clears throat> yeah yeah no it i mean you definitely have a solid handle on it and you mm. upgraded some at some point from uh, your Intuos to the Cintiq, is mm -hmm. that right? Or is it the other way around? Yeah, Intuos. Uh, yeah, I had the Intuos for 15 years. So there are things to be said about Wacom quality. Great I mean, I, that's, what I, that's what I've still been using. It's probably been the same amount of time too, if not longer. So <laughs> so you you'd recommend switching, upgrading? Um, I definitely haven't regretted doing that. Well. One thing is that my tablet did feel like, like the intros did feel like it was kind of on the way out. There mm -hmm. was some, the pressure sensitivity wasn't quite what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So at that point I was like starting to strongly consider that it might be necessary to find a replacement cause what if it breaks down while I'm working on something and so on and so forth. Um, so after thinking about it for a very, 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 very long time, I finally got a Cintiq and it, it's great. <laughs> it's I mean, definitely not, cheap, not regretting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's because it's got the screen on it. So you're, you're, you're drawing, you're painting directly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's apparently also built to last. So it's like, well, well, I'm just going to splurge on this one yeah. thing and, um, absolutely worth it oh cool. right so i was i wanted to ask about work was like what when i look at it and i see you know these glowing animals was that something that you would say came and like evolved gradually over a long period of time through your life or did you find that you know one day or in a short period of time you were making an image and something kind of clicked and you went oh and, and that's where this work was sort of born what, what would you say mm. about the, the, the progression to where you are now well i definitely always liked drawing and sketching all kinds of weird random animals creatures mm -hmm. and that kind of thing so that part that's always been there uh the glowy stuff that's a bit more recent mm -hmm. i might actually be inclined to credit Netrunner for some of that because mm -hmm. they pretty much showed up with our descriptions with them so everything in this is made up of light and bright colors please and weird creatures so it's like this is fun yeah. this is great i'm happy to keep doing this <laughs> though I, I do like doing just shiny things but specifically yeah. i guess combining the animals with that particular manner of drawing shinies yeah i think netrunner has a lot to do with that one <laughs> that's interesting wow yeah I, I can i can definitely see that um how the, the 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 needs of working in that world could have yeah like a an effect yeah, because it's such a i mean it's such a particular niche even a thing to be commissioned to draw because I mean, how often are you going to have commissions that say, hey, we want this to be like super surreal, made of light, maximum shinies, and yeah. just make it surreal. Yeah, yeah. It's a particular kind of thing. <laughs> right. But at the same time, the strength of, you know, there is, there's definitely something to be said for the strength of, of focus, of, of being niche, you know, so having work that is of a very specific kind of flavor that's you know that's a that's a, obviously a big draw for most art directors is they you know they want a person for a particular thing and so 
but you know that being something that you've held on to and carried through it seems to have worked well for you as a stream yeah i mean on one hand i've definitely also tried to expand the subject matter yeah. afterwards because um realistic shading and netrunner because i was drawing just exclusively cyberspace so i wasn't doing a realistic shading so uh, i did have to work a little bit extra on the sides to not forget <laughs> how to shade things under normal light not just things that glow in the dark <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i had that i had the you know and again like i have a, a background in you know traditional stuff but yeah i had that same transit the rocky transition from netrunner to arkham horror where all of a sudden everything was normal lighting mm. or spotlighting or you know mood lighting and uh it, it took a little while to kind of readjust to lighting that just wasn't kind of magically coming from wherever you want mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. suddenly you have to draw things like um pants well i have yeah. I, I ended up doing things like pants and found out that i hadn't drawn pants on anything for a very long time so. yeah. <laughs> Well, that, and that, that leads me to another question I had, which is about reference. I'm just curious, how much of your imagery would you say is uh, just imagined and you're just making it up as you go along with it? And how much would you say you're, you know, posing or finding pictures and um, working directly? Well, ideally, I try to find references that are as close as possible to what I'm drawing, but... Um... It would seem that the moment I start drawing on something that would require such a reference, they just cease existing until I'm done. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I um, usually when I start on something that involves figures or even particular hand poses that, you know, I want to feel natural, but also more interesting and maybe in slightly unusual poses, I will end up doing... Um, a bit of so-called art yoga where I just set up the camera and snap a whole lot of pictures and just explore the movements, mm -hmm. like what's comfortable, what's not, how far, how, you know, bending your wrist, for instance, how far is too far, how far feels good and looks interesting and that kind of stuff. But yeah. um, I try to use references, but I usually can't find anything exact. So <laughs> a lot has to be done by imagination, whether I like it or not. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, a combination, you know, mm -hmm. mostly Im imagined and then when necessary, posing or finding stuff online, which is, I think, mm -hmm. pretty much the way everyone works these days. Yeah, and when it's like specific animals, then I usually look at a whole lot of stuff, like different angles, what right. the shapes are like and that, that kind of thing, yeah. just to get an idea. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm just taking a quick glance and this horse glowing gold horse looks, you know, very anatomically correct. So I would imagine that you were looking closely at horses, horse anatomy. Then. Yeah, at least for horses, you can more or less find references for, you know, all kinds of angles. But when it's something like, hey, we would like the, a glowing pterodactyl uh, lunging at the camera, it turns yeah. out not a lot of references of that for some yeah, reason. Yeah. So for, for that, your like how much of that would be direct from reference versus you're just figuring it out i could more or less find the head from similar angles at least mm -hmm. you know with, with open beak and stuff like figuring out where the eyes are located on eagles mm -hmm. and well the wings are very heavily improvised because uh, they had to look like something in cyberspace, of course, yeah. so I wasn't going to stick too closely to anything. So at that point, just a general sense of motion and shape and uh, weird Chinese takeover. Yeah. And uh, well, for feet, I, I found lots of pictures of um, bird feet and they were cute and they were never from the angle I needed, but yeah. uh, it was enough. Yeah. yeah, it looks great. It works. So um, is there anything that is your like Achilles heel? Are there things that when it comes to you either freak out about or try to avoid or, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like those, those, every, I think everyone has some version of that, something that you just like 
try and steer away from or, or fake it, you know, a little bit? Pants, probably. <laughs> you keep saying pants, but there's pictures here of, of solid. I mean, fabric is really tough. Fabric, getting to fabric is really tough. And I'm looking here at a couple, you know, divide by zero and the gathering both have people wearing clothes. Yeah, it, it was a struggle. The pants were the struggle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, actually, divide by zero was just um, complicated because um, it's a warped landscape and... I don't draw regular landscapes very often. So having to draw a warped one was like, <laughs> The perspective. Yeah. How did you, how did you handle that pers getting the perspective? Cause even though it's, of course it's warped, there is still a, a clear sort of delineation of perspective happening in there. I just kept turning the picture around and mm. more or less checking and rechecking it all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then at the end, of course, I had to paint the magic uh, effects on top of it. So that ended up messing with things a little bit in the end. But it does feel warpy and weird. And I think that was the most important part of that picture in the end, like for the purpose of using it. So yeah, yeah. got there eventually. It was a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you're saying that landscapes you try to is something you are not as comfortable with. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, I just haven't painted a lot of them at this point. So, you know, when something landscapey in nature comes up, which is um, a very infrequently, frankly, usually it's just like a more um, like a more foreground ish, mid ground ish setting for the mm. creature, but. Yeah. It's seldom like an entire landscape thing. Yeah. So having a picture where the landscape is more prominent just by nature of it, it was kind of like, um, hmm, okay, time to learn how to draw that thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're learning on the go, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> do you do you have any from uh, any favorites from Netrunner? Musazi, I think the the crane. Because that was fun. It's basically a grey crane in the picture. It's anything but grey. <laughs> and I just really enjoy drawing that, even though that's kind of a slightly, I guess, niche subject. Because it's just, it's just a crane and it's just um, squawking and it's just being there. I enjoy that one. <laughs> cool. And, you know, again, you, you started doing art when you were a kid, right? So I'm just curious if there's anything that has been a, like a regular source of inspiration that's, that has been something that you've turned to over the years you know, to, um, I don't know, get a little bit of encouragement from? Um, I, it's a difficult question. I mean, I suppose when it comes to more specific inspirations for like facial expressions, mm. my cat is definitely in there because he has a massive eyes and very expressive face, which translates fantastically for when I need to draw something with massive eyes and a very expressive face. <laughs> when I'm drawing some kind of creatures where, where I want to have like um, maybe scrunched nose or making some wild expressions, then it's definitely something to look at because he has a range and um, I will say that range surpasses my own imagination about how the no nose can move, how the brows can move, and how the eyes can move, and that kind of stuff. So it's definitely in there. So um, let's see, I kind of took inspiration for them pop, for the Kamino series. Mm -hmm. And there was that one recent Peeping Tom, that one. It's basically just a creature with massive eyes and a teeny tiny nose peeking behind a wall of some sort <laughs> so that one is in there I'll, I'll, i didn't uh, actually use him for references of actual cats because his face is just too peculiar for that <laughs> so funny he could be someone else's inspiration too now mm -hmm. so <laughs> speaking of uh well that's not fair i was gonna say speaking of distractions but he's not a distraction cats aren't distractions but i i do he's, I do think he's that... totally a distraction don't worry <laughs> okay, sure, it can be uh, I think that's something that we all have to contend with in this day and age is all the sources of things that, that 
want your attention and oftentimes they're valid and you know like news and stuff that's important or you know friends and but there's just there's so many things going on so i'm just curious if you have um like what your relationship with is with being productive and distractions and if you have any kind of you know habits that have helped to just you know stay focused and do the work and not get sucked into scrolling through things all day um I, in a way, I at least partially organize my work depending on the weather, so to say. Because mm. um, so my room is peculiar. My my working room is peculiar in the sense that um, one of the walls is um, quite literally a window, and it's facing west. So, and the walls are fairly light. So even though I do have a fairly good sun blocking curtains. Where there's so much room, there's always going to be some ambient light getting through when the sun is just beaming into that window. So when it's the sunny part of the day, I do something else and I'm productive in other ways. And uh, I'll go out and I'll meet friends when, you know, there isn't a giant raging pandemic out there. (laughs) And uh, when it's dark and quiet, that's that's my working hours, (laughs) usually in the morning. I prefer mornings. I think 4 a.m. Like, is the morning. That's when the nightingales sing. It's like the best part. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I do. I do live fairly far north, so it, in summer, it's um, it actually gets light. The stars getting light at 4 a.m. So it actually is the morning. <laughs> we are fairly far north, so mm-hmm. it, summertime. I think we get like um, six or seven hours of actual nighttime, and during the winter, we get just a little bit of shy of seven hours of what can be even called the daytime so mm. yeah so then i guess does that mean that your does your schedule change in the in the winter months because of the mm-hmm. you know, west sun mm-hmm. in, in winter i have more freedom about when i want to draw and stuff because it's mm. most of the day it's just darkness yeah. i mean at past 3 p.m it's during the darkest time of the winter is basically nighttime outside so <laughs> And in summer, it's um, slightly more restrictive in a sense about when I'm able to draw and see all the like the darker values and stuff without the sun getting in the way. Mm. Eh, it is what it is. So when you're working, do you have a preference? Or I guess the question is like, what's your, like, your perfect working environment? Do you like it quiet or music or listening to you know a podcast or something like that? What what works for you? Um. I usually listen to something in the background. Um, I sometimes listen to Let's Plays because, um, you know, when you're working a lot and when you're pushing towards a deadline or something, you maybe spend a, a little bit more hours working per day than you would necessarily like to. And, you know, you, you sometimes get maybe a little bit tired of work. And it's like, well, I still have this and this and this to do, but it's like, Eh, but I want to entertain myself, so I put Let's Plays on the second screen and I just listen to them, and it's wait, kind wait, of like guys, cheating. Sorry, un- unpack that a little bit because I don't. I'm not familiar with what you're referencing. Oh, okay. So uh, Let's Plays are basically um, I listen to them on YouTube. I presume they also exist in other platforms. It's when uh, somebody plays a game and um, either streams or records the videos. And sometimes they're done with commentary, sometimes they're done without. And it's basically uh, watching somebody play a game, in a sense. Right, okay. And depending on the game type, the experience probably doesn't even change that much, because some games are very (laughs) story-based. And it's basically my way of um, cheating myself into feeling like I'm actually, you know, doing some kind of nonsense, like I'm kind of playing a game or something like that, or listening to a story while I'm actually being productive and working on what I should be working on. (laughs) It helps with a focus. Is that because if you weren't doing art, you're illustrating something, you'd be playing a video game? Not even as often as I'd like to imagine, but... um, and nowadays, I mostly listen to people <laughs> playing the games because um, well, it also helps that I don't have to have all the different platforms that some games are exclusive to. But I do like to unwind after work. Um, currently, my game of choice is uh, Warframe. It's 
it's um, a shooter, looter shooter type of game. And the nice thing about it is that it can have very short like mission runtime. You can accomplish like a little task very quickly, mm -hmm. even under two minutes for some of them. So it's basically my way of um, turning the drawing part of my brain off so I can get some sleep at night. <laughs> oh, gotcha. I see. But the, yeah, I mean, the, listening or having a, someone, a playthrough happening Part of that, I imagine, is I don't know. You tell me. It sounds like it's also it's partly the game, but it's also a, like a kind of like a social standing, mm -hmm. especially during the pandemic. Just having kind of people there and the voices and going, through, you know, have people having experiences that kind of right right near you. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something like that because <clears throat> right now social interactions are what they are. Yeah. Well, I'm lucky in the sense that I live in a neighborhood that's um, fairly open. There is a lot of like green areas here and it's a bunch of apartment buildings like a small cluster so i do interact with my neighbors on a regular basis when we're all going for walks and being socially responsible and not crowding it together in any kind of rooms and such and stuff but um you know it, it's not the same so having like a voice in the background uh, commenting something and um usually cracking jo jokes or whatever it does uh, slightly fill the void of social interactions in these times, so to yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, totally. Also, games often have really good music. That's <laughs> something to be said for that. <laughs> sure. Huh. Yeah. I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I think that's where I get my sense of being around people. Mm -hmm. So, I guess this is the last thing that comes to mind is curious if you were to have if you'd be offered or self-initiated a dream project if you have any have you thought about that at all um i mean i suppose if i were to do something of my own choosing just entirely like a massive big thing it probably would be something with the more surreal themes visually mm -hmm. at least because i like exploring that kind of stuff probably maybe a pinch of horror or something like that yeah, yeah and not necessarily like scary things but more like um weird things you know mm. unconventional things and things that might be scary because of that weirdness that we don't fully really understand or they're just it's something completely alien i guess and different that creeps into the mm. world that's more familiar i wouldn't say mundane i don't, I don't like drawing mundane things <laughs> like pants yeah <laughs> You know, your next brief is going to just be from like Levi's and it's going to be paint pants for us. <laughs> no. It's just, it's come up too much. I'm, I'm just stuck on pants because um, I recently finished, finished an illustration that had um, people in um, sort of very dynamic poses, but that there were pants in there at weird angles. So I kind of... Struggled a little bit because the lighting choices I went with were also a little bit particular. So <laughs> mm. I'm stuck on the experience of pants for a while. <laughs> yeah, I sound traumatized. Impossible angles and like I would need some serious equipment to, to do those kind of poses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess in you know six. What is it? Six months. We'll we'll see. We'll see. Well, the rest of us will see how it looks. Yeah, so something like that. Probably. I think that's about them. Yeah, it's like six to nine months. I think the publishing yeah, delay. Yeah. Not yeah. entirely sure. Well, yeah. it was nice finally chatting with you. Same, and uh, I'm still sorry for leaving that message hanging for five years. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, you know, good luck with everything, and excited to see what you come up with uh, next. And yeah. um, thanks for chatting. Yeah, th thanks for having me for the conversation. It was yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're welcome. And say hi to uh, your cat. What is her name? Cat's name again? Bucha. Bucha. Right. It, it means kiss. Oh, there you go. And it's also very similar to Butsis, which is what we call him sometimes, which is like a kind of an angry, belligerent kind of thing. Because it um, comes from the word Butsinch, which is a uh, ram. So yeah, he has many names <laughs> and many yeah. moods. <laughs> Very cool. And hopefully we'll see more of your cat. <laughs> <laughs>
Definitely. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>